Now, institutionalism is something that political science does. And here are um, some, um, some reasons or some uh, ways of opening, sort of o some orienting thoughts, some orienting thoughts. Um, the claim about institutions, institutions as important, is not a claim about the deepest causes of roots, or roots, deepest cause or deepest roots of the problem. And the claim is that institutions can either aggravate those deeper roots or contain them. Whether or not those deeper roots will disappear, institutionalists argue, is not of fundamental importance to us. Let Gandhians change human nature, they argue. Right? The idea that human beings can be made to love each other even, though, even if they hated each other in the past, let Gandhians do that, those who think like that. We are about creating institutions which would try to check hatreds, if not eliminate them, and propagate greater cordiality, if not make everyone cordial to each other. This is not an argument about human nature leading to conflict or violence. This is an argument about how institutions mediate motivations, deeper motivations, right, and outcomes. Right? This is the best way to think about what, what institutionalism is. If in, the process, if in the process human beings also change their views about others, well and good. If not, we can still check, check the unhealthy impulses or violent impulses and, and produce um, better outcomes. Okay. Um, um, now, institutional designs, and this will be much of the rest of the conversation uh, in the second half, institutional designs should be in accordance with cleavage structures. This is a very important point, and now that gets us into John Stuart Mill and others, and the latest, John Stuart Mill is the father of this argument, and the latest, the most recent great children of the father are Leipart and Horowitz, though they are not exactly the same children. They fight with each other, right? And, and they... they take the, the, the argument forward. Now, John Stuart Mill did not call himself an institutionalist. We are giving him this label. Hmm? Okay. So, <clears throat> the central idea here is that there are clearly identifiable connections between ethnic conflict or peace. Or, I'm, I'm, since I said earlier that conflict does not have to be violent, and, you know, so you can say ethnic violence and peace on one hand and political institutions on the other, it matters whether multi-ethnic societies have consociational or majoritarian democracy, something we'll have a lot of, maybe 20 to 25 minutes on um, uh, in this half. Federal or unitary governments, I'll give an example of that also, a very good example. Single or multiple member constituencies, proportional representation versus first past the post. Very important idea. So, uh, each of these institutional alternatives can be shown to be linked to ethnic peace or violence. That is a better term, not conflict or peace, peace or violence. Right? Ethnic pluralism requires political institutions, forms and rules of power sharing, types of constituencies, varieties of voting systems, party systems, different from those that are appropriate for ethnically homogeneous or, et or at any rate ethnically undivided societies. An uncritical transference an uncritical transference of institutional forms, regardless of whether society is marked by ethnic divisions, can be a serious cause of ethnic conflict. Contrarywise, an institutional choice suited to the ethnic map of a society resolves, so at any rate mitigates conflict. This is the fundamental claim. This is what institutions do. Right? This is not about deeper motives. We don't need psychology, we are saying. Hmm? We don't need psychology. We don't need get great cultural understanding, we are saying, and you will see their limits to this argument as well, right? That we can do, we can deal with ethnic problems through institutions. Okay. Um, this, I think, should be very clear. So let's just rush through this point. Why are institutions so important? 
because institutions do not simply specify procedures, rules and sites for political contestation. In doing so, they also begin to generate predispositions to outcome. Example, if there are only two ethnic communities in a country, if the minority community is more or less evenly distributed across constituencies, if voting takes place entirely on grounds of ethnicity, and if a first-past-the-post system exists, then it can be easily demonstrated that even a minority as large as 40 to 45 percent of the population constituting, constituting a plurality can be entirely excluded from political representation. Right? 50 percent plus one. If it, voting is entirely ethnic and there are two parties and there are two communities, one is a, let's say, Hindu party, one is a Muslim party, Muslims are not 45 percent, even, after, before, even, even before 1947, they were 25 percent. But let's say, it's just to illustrate the point. Hmm? Then, and they're evenly distributed, 40 to 45 percent everywhere, and, Mus and Hindus 50 to 55 percent everywhere, right? Then you can get a result through FPTP, which completely excludes a community that is 40 to 45 percent of the population. Right? Such a majoritarian system is very likely to produce a permanent and sullen minority community. Much passionate conflict, even violence, can be expected. On the other hand, PR, proportional representation, going we use the term PR, can give such a minority major stakes in the system, for it will give them representation in the polity more or less in accordance with their electoral weight. These are two very different ways of organizing election elections and representation in assemblies right so this is uh, 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 the clearest example that we can give as political scientists of why institutions would matter hmm? okay the father of this whole thought though he didn't didn't himself uh, uh, line of thinking though he didn't call himself an institutionalist who was the towering figure of liberal thinking in the second half of the 19th century, John Stuart Mill, incidentally self-taught, never went to university, um, a very, um, uh, a father so dominant, so affectionate as to be dominating and uh, schooling the child at home. Um, and uh, on the assumption that schooling the child at home would give him the best education, in this case that turned out to be right. John Stuart Mill became a towering figure. Doesn't have to be right. Hmm? Um, James Mill was the father, whose work is not of the same standard as his son. Son, son was a towering figure. James was a powerful figure, but not towering intellect. Um, so he makes the argument, it's general a necessary condition for free institutions that the boundaries of governments should coincide in the main with those of the nationalities. Mill thought linguistic diversity was a special, virtually insuperable hindrance to nation building. Since the claim was a nation is a requirement for democracy, the claim also was that linguistic diversity will have to be flattened for democracy to function. Democracy will work if linguistic diversity is flattened. If you give representative democracy to a multi-ethnic society, conflict should be expected. This is the origin, sort of, original formulation of this line of thinking. He also argued, this is a famous passage, I have quoted it in perhaps eight of my articles, so I'm, I can tell you that I'm never tired of quoting it. Hmm? Here is what John Stuart Mill had to say about how to flatten diversity and make democracies work. Nobody can suppose that it is not beneficial to a Breton or a Basque of the French Navarre to, to be brought into the current of ideas and feelings of a highly civilized and cultivated people. Uh, they, this C should not be there, this should be dot, dot, dot. To be a, a, a member of the French nationality than to sulk on his own rocks. This is, uh, this is about Bretons and Basques of France. Then to, to be, to, they should be brought into the Parisian mainstream. 
Otherwise, they would sulk on their own rocks, the half-savage relic of past times, revolving in his own mental little, or little mental orbit, without participation or interest in the general movement of the world. The same remark applies to the Welshman or the Scottish Highlander as members of the British nation. And the, this, this particular chapter goes on to argue Indians also should be civilized by the British. Just as the English had to civilize the Welsh and the Scot, just as the Parisians had to civilize the Bretons and the Basque, Indians could be civilized by the British. This kind of tutelage by a superior group, group was necessary. Linguistic diversity, the most desirable form of flattening linguistic diversity was to be led by the so-called superior group and adopt its styles and give up your language if necessary. If common loyalty to a political center was a precondition for democracy to function, if a multi-ethnic society was likely to have many loyalties, not one, only under the tutelage of a more politically advanced ethnic group can order be maintained and ethnic conflicts avoided. Tutelage was necessary until a civic consciousness toward a political center, not to an ethnic group, emerged. You could say that today's liberal would not recognize this as liberalism. The father of modern liberalism is unrecognizable in this version. No modern day liberal would make this claim. Right? But it's a liberal, it's the father of modern liberalism making this claim. So few would support colonial tutelage today. But the arguments about where, whether multi-ethnic societies can or should have British style majoritarian democracies continue to reverberate. Indeed, theories proposing a link between institutional forms and ethnic conflict required a sophistication never seen before. There are disputes in this literature, but they are about what kinds of political institutions would resolve or exacerbate conflict in multi-ethnic societies. That identifiable links between institutions and ethnic conflict exist is either considered self-evident or not seriously questioned.